Hello and welcome to Chamber Live. It's our Construction Connections event today, East Lanx Chambers Group, which is aimed exclusively at those that are working in or around the construction sector. Uh, the views expressed in this webinar don't necessarily represent the views of the East Lanx Chamber of Commerce and all facts are believed to be correct at the time of recording, which is the 7th of May 2021. Uh, today's event is a real mixed bag of content, but all extremely relevant to the sector. We're looking at ways to recruit new talent into the sector. Uh, we're looking at ways to build sustainability into the sector and opportunities for the sector to invest and develop one of our key boroughs here in East Lancashire. Uh, first up, our virtual host for today's event as well. We were supposed to be at Blackburn College, but uh, clearly right now we can't be. Uh, Blackburn College themselves have got years of experience at bringing through new talent into the construction sector. And so to give us an overview of that, our first speakers are Hannah and Antoinette. Uh, Hannah Baker is Business Development Manager at Blackburn College. She's been at the college for seven years. Her main area of expertise is apprenticeship training and development. Outside of the college, she's got one child of 13. And uh, as we've already heard, she's very involved in restoring a classic mini. And they've got a couple of YouTube channels between herself and her husband, one on uh, woodworking and one on classic mini restoration and she's now going to be a star on the Chambers YouTube channel as well so we'll meet Hannah shortly and also Antoinette Jackson business development manager of Blackburn College. Antoinette's been at the college for 19 years her area of expertise commercial training and development she's also a mum to a 12 year old and claim to fame attended Prince Charles's 70th birthday party in the garden of uh, Buck Pal uh, a few years ago for being recognised for the work that she does with the Prince's Trust so I'm delighted to hand over to Hannah and Antoinette from Blackburn College. Over to you, ladies. Hello, my name's Hannah, Blackburn College. Um, as you've heard, I've been at the college for, for seven years and I love the job that I do. Um, I love talking to people about what their business is and how we can help them grow. So today, we're gonna to talk to you about apprenticeships in general. And then Antoinette will talk to you a little bit more about um, a specific apprenticeship um, that's come, that we're delivering. From September. So, next slide. Okay, so what is an apprenticeship? So, it is a training package of courses um, or skills, knowledge, and behaviours um, that are expected in your industry. So, in the construction trade, you'll be looking at things like joinery um, and carpentry, brickwork, plumbing and heating, that type of thing. And so the apprenticeship is there to provide you with the qualifications that you need in the industry to work in that industry. Um, and also what's expected you as a, an employer, uh, sorry, an employee um, and the behaviours that are attached to that. So making sure that you're working on time and that you're professional. So they are for anybody of any age from 16 plus. So as long as you're not at school, you can do an apprenticeship. And they range from a level two programme all the way through to a degree um, level qualification and these particular apprenticeships and um, they changed probably about four years ago now and um, from uh, frameworks to standards so they cut off the frameworks and um, back in July this, um, so this year yeah it will have been this year um, and they um, they said no more to the frameworks and it's purely standards now so there's a difference in terms of how a standard is delivered to how the old apprenticeships worked um, and I'll go into a bit more detail in the next slide. Okay, so these apprenticeships are designed by employers to fit the purpose of the job role that they're undertaking. And the qualifications usually attach a certificate or a diploma in that industry. Not always, but generally speaking with the construction trades, they do have qualifications attached to them. And they have functional skills at level one or two in maths and English. Um, so if you've not got your GCSEs, then you would need to undertake those as part of your apprenticeship. And as I said, knowledge, skills and behaviours are a major part of what these apprenticeships are. So it's making sure that you are completely competent by the end of your apprenticeship and that you can work in that industry. Next slide, please. OK, so in terms of eligibility, so anyone undertaking an apprenticeship must be in a position that is relevant to the apprenticeship that they're doing so if they're doing brickwork then it would be a brickwork qualification that they undertake they need to be working at a minimum of 30 hours a maximum of 40 
um, and that's for any age of person um, from 16 onwards. Um, they need to undertake what we call a skills scan. And that's basically looking at the learner, seeing what they currently know, and then looking forward to what we want them to be able to learn. So it's kind of like a snapshot in terms of what their current skills are and to be able to show that they've got growth um, if they completed the apprenticeship. So I said previously that you'll need to have maths and English at grades A to C or four to nine as they are now. Um, and if you've not got that, then we'd have to do an initial assessment to see whether or not they've got the skills to be able to undertake the apprenticeship. Um, and if they have, then that's fine and we can put them on the functional skills so that they've got the maths and English qualifications at the end of their apprenticeship. In terms of commitment as an employer and as an apprentice, um, there is an expectation that all apprenticeships are a minimum of um, a year. Some of the construction trades, depending on the levels that you have, can go up to four years. And it's just being mindful of the time that you're thinking that these people might be on programme with us. So it's making sure that your business plan supports um, having an apprentice for that length of time. It's also mandatory that the apprentice has at least 20% uh, of their working week off the job. So we tend to cover that by one day a week in college where they attend classes and they've got tutorials that they, they undertake as well. Um, and they also have regular reviews um, with their assessors, um, usually maybe once every month, um, which you have again with yourselves. Um, and those are probably done as a, like a three meeting to see whether or not there's any issues in terms of um, not hitting assignment deadlines and all that kind of stuff. So there is a commitment from everybody that will stick to the program and get that qualification completed. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, so as I said before, there are some changes in terms of the apprenticeships. So no longer can you just be assessed by your assessor to see if you're competent. There now is an independent um, function that you've got to go through and that's called the gateway. Um, so once you've finished your qualifications and your training, you go to gateway and you complete an endpoint assessment. And the endpoint assessments are different for every apprenticeship standard. Um, so if we took, for instance, brickwork as, a, as an apprenticeship, then the endpoint assessment for that is a three part stage. So you'll have a online assessment with 40 questions, which are multiple choice. You'll have a skills test where somebody um, external to um, the college comes in and observes somebody undertaking a particular task and then they'll have a portfolio that they've produced throughout their apprenticeship which they are then asked questions on so there's three parts to that particular endpoint assessment and at the end of it it's either a fail a pass or a distinction so there are um, different pass levels um, for apprenticeships now as they didn't used to be great so there was some changes back in 2017 now um, so the apprenticeship digital account was created really um, to support employers having the choice of where they would like their training to be and how much they would um, pay for their apprenticeship training so the digital account was created and a new sort of payye scheme um, for employers was introduced specifically for levy payers. So if you're a levy paying company and your payroll is over at 3 million, then you will pay 0.5% of that payroll into a levy account. And you use that money to pay for your apprenticeships. Um, and the government also give you a top up, I think it's about 10%. So for every pound that you put in, they'll put 10p in. So on there, you attach your apprenticeship training and you pay for it monthly through this account and um, one thing to think about is whether or not if you are a levy payer whether you want to spend some of that money to your supply chain and also if you have supply chains in uh, that you work with whether or not they want to transfer any funding across to you so that you can spend it on apprenticeship training so that's something to think about um what else is there oh if you're a non-levy payer 
So if you're a non-levy payer, then if you are taking an apprentice and you employ less than 50 people, then it will be fully funded by the government. So the funding available for the training is, is funded completely by the government. Um, if you are um, a small company and you take somebody um, that's 19 plus or you employ over 50 people, then you get 95% of the funded paid by the government and you pay 5%. So for something like Brickwork, normally it would be £9,000 for the levy account if you're a levy payer, but if you're a non-levy payer, 16 to 18, it'd be fully funded, but if it was um, 19 plus or over 50, you'd be paying £450 for an apprenticeship, which is not a lot of money really in terms of training and development. Um, other things that might be of interest, so there are government incentive grants at the moment um, up until September and that is for any new apprentice that you take on, you can get £3,000, so um, whereas you used to only be able to get um, funding or incentive payments for 16 to 18, so they have actually opened that up for any age now, but if you are taking a 16 to 18 year old then you can get a further thousand pounds so you're looking at around four thousand pounds for a new apprentice of 16 to 18 which is really good um for some of these courses as well for construction if you are a citb uh, member you can claim citb grants for some of these so that's additional incentives that are there available for you uh, but you need to speak to citb for the people that that would be relevant for um, what else can we talk about? Um, okay. Oh yeah. So obviously this is about construction, but there might be other vacancies or um, apprenticeship opportunities within your companies, um, from receptionists all the way up to your senior management team. We are looking um, to be starting a new apprenticeship called Senior Leader at Level Seven from September. So if there is anybody that might be interested in that can always look at um, management qualifications as well as the construction credits. Okay, next slide. So I shall pass you on now to Antoinette, who's going to talk to you a bit more detail about the higher level apprenticeships. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Um, are you okay to go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so we have different trade um, apprenticeships. So we've got brick, brick, layer level two carpentry and joinery and um, we've also got gas we've got our own gas center at the saturn center on challenge way in blackburn um plumbing electrical and um we've just launched a construction site supervisor course as well next slide please, please. okay so this um construction site supervisor level four course um we've we've just launched and it launched and it starts in september it's basically equivalent to the hnc construction and built environment course the requirements for this course is five gcses or equivalent which includes mass english and science or a level two apprenticeship and the main duties included in the apprenticeship are supervision of contractors health and safety construction projects, quality of the construction projects, as well as monitoring costs. Next slide, please, thank you. So upon successful achievement um, of this apprenticeship, um, to, if, people, if the learners get a merit, they can then progress on to a degree programme, um, which is in building, surveying, project management, um, quality surveying. So yeah, um, this this apprenticeship is um, three years. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Great, thank you, ladies. Um, I'm going to stop screen share. So I, if nothing else, I can get a better view of um, if anyone's waving wildly at the camera. Um, if you do have any questions um, for Blackburn College, for Hannah and Antoinette, just um, unmute your microphone and, and let us have them if you can, please. Um, I don't know if this is for Hannah or for Antoinette, but I know it's quite a daunting topic. Certainly, I feel like there's so many um, nuances with the apprenticeship world. 
I, 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 I assume you're well um, set up to be able to deal with dumb questions from from newbies to the apprenticeship world, so, like the funding and things like that. Any question is fine. There's no silly questions when it comes to apprenticeship funding because it's different for everybody. Um, and there are nuances to every business um, and even every learner, it can be it can be different. So there is no silly questions. You can ask anything. Oh, I bet I could come up with some silly questions. But, but <laughs> well, thank <heard> you. <laughs> All right, well, um, if there's no questions, we will include um, Hannah and Antoinette's contact details um, in the um, in the follow-up email, which Debbie's going to send. I'm just checking that comment then. Oh, there we go. Um, hello, Anne from UCLAM. Um, Anne says, we're starting our de degree apprenticeship in architectural technology. It would be good if we could join the construction site superv supervisory level four to the AT route. Some acronyms there that I don't understand, but I'm sure I'm sure you do. <laughs> I'm not sure myself, but yes, we can always talk about it. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, maybe you can um, be in touch with each other after the meeting. Thank you. Um, thanks for that yeah. comment, Anne, and thank you again yeah, that's fine. to Antoinette and to Hannah. Uh, well done. Right. I'll um, I'll move on to our next uh, speaker. Um, it's an organisation that you might not expect to appear at a construction sector event, uh, which is exactly why. Uh, they're here now to explain more about the Building with Nature programme. I'm going to hear from Rachel Cripps at the Lancashire Wildlife Trust. Um, Rachel's a senior conservation area officer at Lancashire Wildlife Trust, as well as being a mini enthusiast. We've got a disproportionate number of mini enthusiasts on today's event. Um, Rachel leads on the development of the Trust's conservation works in North Merseyside, developing and managing new projects which can include everything from new nature reserves, living landscapes and seas, ecological surveys, community conservation projects. She's got 15 years experience working within animal welfare and the conservation sector. She's got a fascinating story about her dog and squirrels as well. If, we, if, we get to, if we've got time in the Q&A, someone ask her about her dog and squirrels if it doesn't come up. Uh, she spent eight years managing the Trust Red Squirrel project and she's now a Building with Nature approved assessor and wants to use those skills to promote and encourage the integration of green infrastructure into developments for the benefit of wildlife and people. Delighted to introduce Rachel Cripps. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, that's quite the introduction, isn't it? <laughs> it's weird when you hear someone else talk about you like that, but uh, thank you for, for having me here today. I will just share my screen with my presentation. There, can everyone see that okay? That's working fine. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about building with nature, which is basically um, a set of um, green infrastructure standards that can be applied to developments um, to benefit. Well, the, the aim is to make kind of quality places that benefit um, people and wildlife. Um, so before I start, Simon, I've, I've just wanted to ask my first poll question, if that's OK. Um, and I just wanted to know if anyone's actually heard of building with nature before or or if anyone's kind of had any experience with any other um, similar schemes like BRIAM or, or anything like that. So. I think I may have made an error because I've loaded all three of your questions in one poll. So oh, everyone's getting sorry. every question all at once, Rachel. <laughs> Apologies for that. That's all right. No worries. <laughs> give people um, a, yeah. a minute or two to oh, the, the results are starting to come in. I was worrying it wasn't working then for a minute, but they're yeah. coming in now. <laughs> give everyone a chance to read all the questions. <clears throat> oh, that's great. We've got a couple of people who have heard about it already. Give another 10 seconds just to let, yeah. uh, I'm aware we're pushing people, but uh, 10 seconds and, then, <laughs> and then, we'll, then we'll publish the results. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. And we'll call it there and uh, share the results back.
So we've got a couple of people who have heard about Building with Nature. That's good. Well, um, hopefully I've, I've got some new information for you today. Um, interesting. Hopefully, well, the barriers will will go through and I might hope we'll be able to leave anyone's concerns about that and um yeah right brilliant i will uh carry on then so um what is building with nature well it is the uk's first benchmark for green infrastructure Building with Nature itself is actually a charitable company um, and its aim is to mainstream high quality green infrastructure um, to raise the bar for UK industry through supporting and championing best practice and um, the, the standards, the set of standards that have been developed are actually free to use um, by anybody. And that is really because the mission is to make high quality green infrastructure integral to kind of place making in the UK and to maximize those benefits and um, so by making them free to use the hope is that more people will will get involved and will use them so the standards themselves draw on evidence and good practice guidance um, they define high quality green infrastructure at each stage of the development process so from planning and design right through to delivery and then long-term management and maintenance um, the, we have an expert standards board whose role is to refresh the standards and update them in changes um, in legislation and policy. And um, on that board sits a, a wide variety of organisations. We have academics, um, representatives from Natural England and also from organisations such as Taylor Wimpy. So why do we need a benchmark? Um, obviously you've been, um, I think the, the slides have been handed out to you, so I won't go th um, through each of these quotes in turn, um, but these are just some, some quotes from different organizations on kind of how they see a benchmark benefiting um, developments in, in the UK. And then who is the benchmark for? Well, it's for everybody really. So um, from the general public, so down to homeowners who want to better understand the importance of kind of nature in the built environment in their communities, um, to developers to help reduce planning uncertainty and for planners um, to help them plan for, for better outcomes. Um, it's, it's a user-friendly guide for, for everybody. So delving into a little bit more detail on what Building with Nature can deliver. Um, so for developers, the, the key benefit really is, is it hopes to reduce that planning uncertainty. So by adopting a shared framework of principles, it can help smooth the passage through planning um, and just make it a much um, smoother process. Um, it can create a positive story to engage local communities and attract consumers who value those benefits of living with nature. Um, so with that, that obviously brings a bit of a marketing benefit. So um, there's more attractive properties with a good story to, that you can tell to buyers. It's value for money and accessible. As I said, the standards are free to use. Um, that works for all contexts of residential and commercial benefit um, developments. So whether it's 20 houses or 500 houses or, you know, there's motorway service stations and hospitals, it can be applied to, to any development. And really it's about turning those ecological constraints into new opportunities to deliver nature rich development. So whether that's by using soft drainage solutions instead of hard solutions or habitats that need less maintenance long term. Um, there's ways that by providing those those ecological benefits, they're actually benefits rather than constraints and can actually um, save money in the long term as well. And then for planners, a building with nature is a mechanism to secure net gain, biodiversity net gain, health, well-being, natural water management, and then connection with that wider landscape as well. Um, it gives a clear picture of what good green infrastructure looks like and offers that shared framework of principles that can be adopted by the local planning authority and the applicants. So everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak, and it just makes that process much clearer. Um, and it also gives the ability to draw on that supporting specialist knowledge that may not be held in-house with the local authorities. So I'm um, guessing everyone might have heard of, of Biodiversity Net Gain with the um, Environment Bill going through at the moment, and Biodiversity Net Gain will be mandatory um very soon hopefully um and that is about instead of 
no net loss of biodiversity with development. It's about ensuring there is a net gain. And the figure at the moment is a 10% net gain for biodiversity with the development. So in short, how building with nature fits into this is kind of biodiversity net gain is the what and building with nature is the how. So building with nature can be a mechanism for making biodiversity net gain happen on site within the development, which in which will save money. Um, off site mitigation through biodiversity net gain is potentially going to be quite costly. And um, the more that can be achieved on site, the better for nature and also um, is cost saving as well. So as biodiversity net gain becomes mandatory for all housing and commercial developments in England, it will need to be considered and incorporated at an early stage. Um, and so Building with Nature kind of gives that framework and is a tried and tested way of, of doing that. Right, I will move on now to giving a bit more information about the Building with Nature standards. So um, the standards framework brings together existing guidance and good practice, as I said before, um, through all stages of the development process, um, from planning, design, delivery, and then through to long-term management and maintenance. The standards can be applied at any stage in the development and planning process, although it is recommended um, that design teams engage as early on as possible, um, just because it makes the process so much smoother. Um, the standards can assist with decision making relating to each stage of the development process and can be used for residential, commercial and mixed use developments. Um, even though the, the standards can be applied to, to well, a wide range of developments, it is best suited to major and significant sites, so anything more than 10 houses or half a hectare. Um, and then they focus, the standards focus around three themes, well-being, water and wildlife. Now, the standards are currently being reviewed and are going to be finalised at the end of this month. I was really hoping that I'd get to present to you the new standards because um, they have been majorly simplified and are much, much better. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to go through the old standards with you. Um, so there may seem to be a bit of repetition. Um, and there's quite a lot of them, but the new standards have been reduced down to just 12. So um, it is a much a much simpler process, but I, it, the the theme is the same. So the core standards um, are basically there to distinguish green infrastructure from a more conventional approach um, to providing open and green space. So whether um, instead of having kind of your green space in in one area of the development, it's about creating a multifunctional network that also links into the wider landscape and the wider context. Um, it's climate resilient, so minimizes the scheme's environmental impact um, with respect to air, soil, light, noise, and water, and um, is also future-proof, so makes make some long-term um, provision for management and maintenance of the green infrastructure on site. Now the standards, um, Building with nature is all about people and wildlife. So there are a set of well-being standards as well, which aim to secure health and well-being through the delivery of green infrastructure. Um, and the key here is making sure that the green infrastructure is accessible um, to, to everyone and all year round, that it's inclusive and encourages everyone to use the green infrastructure and considers the needs of those vulnerable and excluded groups as well. Um, it's designed to encourage use of the green infrastructure and um, again is, is innovative, um, innovative solutions to overcoming those social and cultural barriers to kind of people in engaging with their natural environment. And then there's the water standards. Um, so these are uh, kind of focused on things like um, reducing water quantity, so sustainable drainage, minimising surface runoff, manage, uh, managing flood risk and maintaining the natural water cycle, improving the quality of water within the boundary of the scheme, um, and making sure as well that um, any sub schemes enhance the capacity of the green infrastructure to provide those benefits for people and for wildlife as well, so maximising those opportunities for biodiversity. 
And then finally, we have the wildlife standards. Um, and this is about ensuring that the, um, the development creates places where nature can flourish. So that's within the boundary of the scheme, but also connecting to um, a wider landscape scale as well. So um, the main aim really is to ensure that existing valuable habitats are retained, um, but then also suitable new ones are created as well to, to give that enhancement. So um, also ensuring um, green infrastructure ensures linkages between habitats and that's within the boundary of the scheme and where possible linking to the wider context as well. Um, and the sensitive construction really is ensuring that the scheme secures biodiversity measures in all stages of implementation. So um, all through the construction process as well, um, ensuring that biodiversity is protected um, and in, in each phase of the development. So there is a, an accreditation and award. So the standards are free to use for, for everybody. Anybody can get them from the website and um, implement any part of them into their development at all. Um, but then if you wanted to get your scheme accredited, there are two ways to do that. So that's um, with the Building with Nature Design Award. So this accredits schemes at the design stage. And then the Building with Nature Full Award, which um, accredits either a phase of a development or post completion. Um, with the current standards, you can have either a good or an excellent full award, depending how many of the standards you meet. Um, but going forward with the new standards, as there will be less of them, it will just be one full award. Um, and then if you are if you have a scheme accredited um, by Building with Nature, then you are entered into the national awards, which are um, judged and awarded by the Landscape Institute at their annual awards ceremony as well. So just to finish off, I just wanted to go through um, a few examples of how this building in nature has already been implemented throughout the whole of the UK, um, England and Scotland. I don't know if there's actually been any in Wales, but it is applied throughout the whole of the UK. Um, so Elderberry Walk is a residential development of 161 houses on a brownfield site and um, this was a really high density development and so it was really good to show how quality green infrastructure can be implemented in that situation. The whole development focused around a central green street that provided um, those well-being benefits through communal wildlife gardening and edible planting, but then also habitat and biodiversity benefits as providing habitat and foraging for bats. And then there was also sustainable drainage integrated into that as well. And this received a Building in Nature Design Award. And then moving on to Gloucester Services, um, widely reputed to be the best motorway services in the UK. I don't know if anyone's been to Gloucester Services, but it is a wonderful <laughs> service station. Um, so the ambition here was to have minimal impact on the surroundings because um, it was very close to the Cotswolds area of outstanding natural beauty. So it wanted to connect into that surrounding landscape and have minimal impact. Um, this did receive a Building with Nature full award. And um, the, um, the applicant, the feedback from the applicant on this one was that the process of building with nature actually helped in refining plans to enhance the wetland habitat and identify improvements to the long term management and maintenance. And then finally, um, the Fourth Valley Hospital up in Scotland. Um, so as you can see, there's a, a huge range of um, projects that these standards can be applied to. Um, and this was um, at the point of completion back in 2010, it was actually Scotland's largest ever NHS construction project. So it was um, eight, 860 inpatient beds, um, over 25 wards and there were 16 operating theatres as well so huge hospital and the building with nature standards were applied to help capture the preventative health benefits of green infrastructure of people having that connection with nature and that was for staff as well as for um, patients at the hospital as well and this was actually winner of the building with nature national awards um, in 2020. 
So that's a quick summary of building with nature. Um, I think we've got some time for questions if anyone does have any questions. My contact details are on that slide there, otherwise they, I think they've been circulated. So if anyone does want to contact me to discuss any potential projects or just to find out more, um, I'm very happy to do that. Um, and it, it would be great um, Hannah and Antoinette, I, I don't know if you think this would link in with um, apprenticeships as well. Maybe we could discuss that um, that more. So I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Rachel. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone's got any uh, specific questions they want to put to Rachel on uh, on building with nature or anything she's touched on, don't be shy. We've got a small enough group. Just unmute yourself. Hi, Simon. Um, so Rachel, Simon from Blackburn, Darwin Council. Hello. Um, hi, I thought excellent presentation. Thanks very much for sharing that. And uh, you've actually given a quite a comprehensive um, submission to the council as part of the local plan process. And that's something that we're going through in a lot of detail. And I can see an awful lot of merit in, in that approach. And it's something we as a council support. And I can already see some of our strategic sites benefiting from that approach. So oh, it's, it's, it's something that I'll encourage my colleagues we're leading on the detail to perhaps pick up with you uh, offline. But uh, yeah, re really excellent. Really yeah. excellent. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's my, it's my colleague, um, David Dunlop, I yes. think, who, um, who, has, who has responded. But, um, yes. but yeah, I, either one of us, um, happy to engage in any, any more discussion. That's, that's brilliant, Rachel. Yeah, well, we'll pick up with you up offline on brilliant. that. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. We'll, we'll see you again very shortly. Um, last Thanks, chance uh, for questions. Go on, Debbie. As a future potential uh, new home buyer, I would be very swayed by um, something, you know, a property that had been built with nature considered. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of feedback there from a potential consumer's perspective. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that's one of the main aims really is to create nice places for people to live. Um, and I think it's been with the pandemic as well, everyone's been so much more appreciative of having a garden, you know, during lockdown. And um, uh, yeah, if, if more schemes were had were built with building with nature in mind, I think it, it could benefit people in huge ways. Um, Anne from, um, I can't remember where Anne's from, forgive me. Anne says, what about retrofit projects? Is it possible to sort of retrospectively go back and, and amend developments and build sustainability and building with nature into something that already exists? Potentially, potentially. Um, it is easier to um, engage with the standards earlier on um, in kind of in that design process, but it all depends, yeah, I would not say no to anything really because it depends what you've got um, and there's always room to improve things. So um, yeah, if you have something in mind and, and you would like us to take a look at it, then please get in touch. Great, thank you. And Anne's from ACT. Um, and just very, just um, quickly, Rachel. Oh, there's go on. one more question come in from John Boyce from, um, from Boyce Construction. It's come directly to me instead of to the group. Oh. And it's for Rachel. Uh, what does, Oh, sorry, does this scheme fit in with BREAM standards, B R W E A M standards? Yeah, so it 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 is different to the BREAM standards. Um, the the aim was to make this simpler, really, than than that because that's been going for a long time, and and there aren't very many accreditations. Um, so it it does it's it's similar, but. It's different, if that makes any sense, without going into too much detail here. Um, but I'm happy to discuss that with him out, outside if, 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 um, if he does want some more information. But um, overall, um, this obviously takes into account more the well-being side of things as well. And it is a simpler process and the standards are free. So. Great. Thank you for the question, John. And thank you, Rachel. Uh, well, uh, we will include Rachel's contact details in the post-event email. Um, so if anyone wants to pick up directly with her, then then please do. Um, final word goes to Anita, who has been to Gloucester Services, but doesn't say how often she frequents said establishment or for what purpose. So maybe, we, maybe we'll pick that up offline, Anita. Thanks, uh, Rachel. And on to our next speaker. We've uh, we've already met him, um, but and last by no means least, certainly it's important to say that. Time to take a look into the future, uh, specifically the future of one of East Lancashire's uh, most important boroughs, Blackburn with Darwin and their local plan. Now, 
when you say local plan, a lot of people's eyes just glaze over that term. But actually, the detail behind them is fascinating because it's the junctions we all use. It's the massive new residential de developments in the communities that we all live and work in, the, the town centres we all shop in and the business parks that many of us may grow and develop into in years to come. Uh, to explain more, Simon Jones then is the growth director for Blackburn with Darwin Council. He's got responsibility for leading the council's growth programme. Uh, this includes the direct delivery of projects through joint ventures and partnerships for employment, housing, town centre schemes, and the promotion of all council-owned assets for development. Simon's also the key lead for the development of the borough's new local plan, which provides a blueprint for the council's future land use needs. His background is in engineering, is experienced in design, management, construction, and development of capital projects across a wide range of sectors and has been in post uh, since 2017. Simon, back to you. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, I'm just uh, gonna share my screen. Oh, there we go, okay. Okay, thanks for that. Um, do you want to just go to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, Blackburn, a grown borough. So I thought I'd just set the scene with a bit of history on Blackburn over the last uh, few years. So. In, in the five years or so leading up to our, the current pandemic, uh, believe it or not, our business base outperformed regional and national trends. Uh, sounds hard to believe, but it did. Um, our economy was growing at a faster rate than the Northwest and the UK as a whole, uh, as the borough continued to be a very attractive proposition to both our indigenous entrepreneurs within, within the borough, which I'll say a bit more about them, in, in, the few, in the next few minutes and together with inward investors. Um, so the foundations for our growth were set probably about 10 years ago when our current local plan agreed to ambitious housing and employment targets. This was followed in 2015 where we identified uh, a release of Greenbelt sites, um, which helped to uh, identify a pipeline for our future growth together with a number of brownfield sites. This approach, as I'm sure you'd all appreciate, releasing Greenbelt uh, in any council is uh, controversial. Um, however, with strong sort of civic leadership and an executive management team, this has been translated into tangible outcomes. So since then, the borough's growth has improved significantly, as I've said, with our GVA increasing faster than the Northwest. It was 24% in that period, whereas the Northwest was at 16%. And this resulted over the five years up to the pandemic of around 5,000 additional jobs in the borough, uh, 2,000 of which were manufacturing, being delivered um, together with uh, around 1,700 new family homes, which I'll explain just how much of a challenge that was and how we've delivered on that. And homegrown businesses like Eura Garages, Gap, Acro, and again, I'll say a few words about them uh, shortly. I think there's a poll here, Simon, that if you could um, just click on. There we go. Well, I'm pleased to see that everybody thinks it's important. Uh, I was worried that somebody might say it's not important. Um, so I'm really pleased about that. And, and the borough has been on this growth strategy. And indeed, we, we actually um, uh, held a consultation around the growth strategy you know, to the, to the residents and businesses to ask them the question. Um, because it's important that we you know we bring everybody on side. So that's really, really good feedback. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so the local plan, as I'm sure everyone uh, appreciates, affects every resident and business uh, in every area and every community in the borough. So in order to maintain that growth that I've mentioned in the previous slide, um, we and to ensure that continuous pipeline of projects, the council began with a new local plan in 2018. And generally, local plans are refreshed every five years. Um, so uh, even though it's got a long sort of time horizon, every five years is when councils refresh uh, their local plans. So our ambitious new plan uh, covers a 15 year period. And you might look at 2018 to 37 and notice that's not 15 years, um, but the plan is to adopt uh, the plan in 2022. So it needs to extend for 15 years past adoption. Uh, and uh, the, the local plan takes uh, a number of years to actually go through all the consultations. So our new plan uh, is, is, is still ambitious. We're looking at creation of a new 
seven seven thousand homes uh, over this plan period, five thousand jobs minimum. Uh, likely that it will be double or treble that amount, and that um, we're allocating land that should generate around 2.5 million square feet of business space, which is, is significant. So over this past year, the borough has been one of the most affected uh, boroughs in terms of COVID in the country. I think as East Lancashire as a whole has, has, has been uh, affected, but Blackburn certainly is, has been one of the most. And you know this can be explained probably in part by the multi-generational families living together in the sort of small terraced housing, you know, two up, two downs. So our plan re-emphasises the importance that we attached on providing higher quality uh, and affordable housing within the borough. So the council uh, makes no apologies on focusing on increasing housing um, because all the research does point towards quality housing being directly linked to economic growth and to public health outcomes. So we need to keep growing as a borough. Um, if we don't do this, then you know, it's clear in all the research that the demographic forecasts uh, indicate that the working age population would decline. And so the proportion of older population would increase and that would place even greater strain on our public services uh, without generating the, the income to the, to the borough. Okay, I think there's the next poll here now, Simon. That's that's really interesting. So we, I was hoping that it would be a balance of all three. I, I don't think you can really major on any one, you know, and the local plan is for everybody. And, you know, as a council, we need to ensure that there's a right balance. Um, so uh, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with the, uh, the, the majority there. OK, thank you. So... As you can see, uh, the local plan is, is, is quite a daunting document, and I say document, but there's about 50 or so supporting documents uh, that go into making up the uh, local plan. Uh, this is just a, an overview of the, of the strategy of it. Uh, if you just press the next slide, Simon, it should just focus on the next, that's it, yeah. So I just wanted to give a, a very brief overview of the housing and economic developments, you know, be it that we're construction event, and some of the infrastructure, um, but you know Rachel's presentation, you know, is is very much intertwined in in, in some of our uh, core policies around climate change and heritage and design. So you know, I wouldn't uh, discount anything what Rachel said. I just think I, I needed to focus on something, so uh, I'm going to focus on some of the development side uh, of of the local plan. So if you could just go to the next slide. So so I just want to sort of put this slide up because. I know we're all past these sort of perceptions, but uh, for, for, for people that maybe just tune in on YouTube, you know, the, the sort of impression is that we all live in two up, two downs in, in East Lancashire. Um, so this was the challenge back in 2015 where we needed to significantly improve our housing performance, but not just growth, it was quality and housing mix and tenure type. So we wanted to encourage that larger family housing because the borough does have a very high percentage of the typical terrace property. So high, in fact, that over 70% of our uh, stock is actually within band A and band B of the uh, council tax classification bands when, you know, ideally you want to be, you know, band D uh, equivalents uh, otherwise. Um, the the, uh, the the challenges there is you know all the stock is 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 two up two down so that's that's the perception that we had probably back you know five to ten years ago where if you just go to the next slide Simon and and this is certainly not the majority of our housing stock but I think it gives you a, a, a nice overview of um, that the fact we've now got a very active housing market um, whereas previously we didn't. And, you know, that was, you could go back to HMR days, housing market renewal and monitoriums, but we were very keen to try and encourage an active market in, in the new build um, developers. So we now have a, a variety of sites from small sites at say 30 dwellings, right up to the larger sites of 800 dwellings. So the examples that you can see there are from established developers on live sites in Blackburn, you know, their houses that have been built and people are living in. So I'm sure you agree it's, uh, we're, we're certainly trying to change the perception, um, but it's a message that we probably continually uh, have to, have to uh, strive to uh, achieve. This in turn with this quality of housing 
has increased house values and land values and so only 10 years ago you know that would be un unimaginable in terms of some of the values that we're now achieving within the borough uh, which helps to sort of create that sort of um, uh, sustainable housing market thanks simon so ju just to sort of reiterate that that's backed up by you know government stats so there's there's a, a statistic called the housing delivery test um and back in 20 uh, 18 we're in the bottom 20 percent in terms of our housing delivery I'm pleased to say now as of this year we're actually in the top 10 percent so it's just to show that you know within three to four years we've we sort of turned it around and now you can see with these completions that it's it's, it's an active market and and one that we're you know, we're very very proud of okay so just in terms of the plan we propose to allocate around 66 housing sites Many of these are reallocated from the previous plan. And although the council has not released any green belt uh, as part of this local plan uh, for housing, the council is proposing to release safeguarded land, which uh, was, was safeguarded in the last local plan. Um, the council is very supportive in bringing forward brownfield sites. I was pleased to see many of these sites in Blackburn are now deliverable due mainly because of that increase in value that I mentioned means that the site constraints can be dealt with within the normal development appraisal um, and that's very good because it prevents the need for any public subsidy to support um, challenging sites. In addition the council does encourage uh, small builders through releasing very small sites you know less than 10 units to the market and it does have a, a self-build register um, which councils are, are expected to keep. And we are trying to identify uh, self-build sites within our new local plan. So any budding grand design candidate out there, um, have a look at the register and, uh, and, and see if any suit you. Uh, finally, just to mention one of our partners, Places for People, has just uh, completed a, well, our first major modular housing site which you know, modular housing will be a, a theme running through housing delivery in the future. And that was for 76 affordable homes within the borough. So um, as I say, you know, we're, we're trying to ensure that we, we cover all those angles uh, in our new local plan. Okay. So in terms of employment land, this is in very high demand uh, within the borough, which you know, sort of goes to, and demonstrate that um, expectations around growth that it is being followed through in terms of the uh, business sector and the council's keen to ensure that we have a good supply of land uh, available for new businesses to relocate but also our existing businesses that are looking to expand the last thing that we would want as a council is an existing business wanting to uh, expand and having to relocate outside the borough you know that that's something that you know isn't someone we try and make sure that we uh, that isn't doesn't happen so we therefore identified a number of new sites within southeast blackburn some of them uh particularly the junction five sites I'll, I'll mention in the next few slides okay and this is just a snapshot of some of the businesses so top top left that's uh Acrol's, uh head office and manufacturing facility over off roman road um that was created by um uh, blackburn uh, brothers that uh, developed that business is now a 4250 they sold out and it's a it's a very successful business we've got gap um that make um uh, all the aluminium sorry all the upvc um, window frames and doors for um, supply chains for the house building industry bottom left that was a a, a building you might see that on the m65 big shiny blue building and that was a new investor into the borough called Mardix. They manufacture high voltage switch gear and transformers. And then I'm sure no one needs any introduction with Euro garages and, and the work that those the brothers have been doing over the number of past years. And then in the middle is the uh, is the new commercial district within the town centre. Okay. So we've identified, so just to come to sort of the, the, the meat within the local plan, we identified big six ideas. Um, these sort of capture some of the more significant opportunities. And I'd just like to briefly go through some of these uh, in the next few slides. Okay. So 
So the first one is, uh, it's called the Blackburn Growth Axes. So the boroughs delivered this strong economic performance, as I've mentioned, as one of the North's leading centres for manufacturing. Um, and the idea of the Blackburn Growth Axes is an economic strategy that links the good work that's being carried out over at Salmsbury uh, Enterprise Zone and linking some of that thinking and business clustering uh, through new strategic sites in the town centre, but also out at Junction 5 and Junction 6. Um, this hopefully will help uh, drive um, new business growth in zero carbon technologies, digital manufacturing and health innovation sectors. Okay. So Darwin Town Deal Development Programmes. Darwin was one of uh, the towns selected for the new uh, Town Deal uh, Investment Programme. And so colleagues have been working hard in pulling that together for funding. Funding bid went in um, several at the beginning of the year, actually. And it's hoped that an imminent announcement will be forthcoming for new funding. And it's hoped that that will leverage in around 100 million of private sector funding, and that's covering a whole range of projects, employment, housing, stalled sites, um, sports and leisure, town centre sites, town centre projects. Um, so really, really uh, hopeful that's going to come through and that's going to be a, a programme of activity over the next five years to, to really help transform Darwin. Um, so that's, we're really, really um, pleased with that uh, initiative. Okay. Uh, this is something where we'll be uh, calling on Rachel's help uh, in the future. Um, so this is a new long-term urban extension planned for the northeast of Blackburn, edge of the Ribble Valley. And we believe this will yield up to 1,500 new homes. So this was land that was formerly in the green belt that was safeguarded as part of the um, previous local plan. So this strategic site will be delivered over a sort of 25 to 30 year period and will include new infrastructure such as uh, link roads, school places, community facilities, local shops and importantly green infrastructure uh, where you might be able to make out some of the green infrastructure um, connections uh, through the site but green infrastructure will play a very large part of this strategic site. Um, it is owned by multiple landowners including the council I'm pleased to say that we've all signed up to a collaboration agreement to work together to bring this site forward. So it's in all our interest to, to make sure that we deliver on all those aspects of quality, including green infrastructure. Um, this is a large strategic site for the, for the county, for Lancashire, um, probably uh, the site of Bale Rig being larger, I think that's the largest um, garden villages as, as they call it and probably Hunco albeit you know a mix of employment housing is is still to be sort of decided but it's certainly up there as one of the bigger sites within within the county okay this is a, um, a I mean all these sites that we release and um, of this size are uh, controversial but anything where we'll identifying potentially a site to come out of green belt is, is always uh, got its controversy and um, this is a site at junction 5 of the m65 i think we all um are aware of how um how uh, dense the, op um, the employment is around junction 5 and, and the growing businesses around junction 5 and you know most businesses want to be located in and around motorway junctions for obvious reasons so this is a site that we've been uh, considering for a number of years and um, we're putting this forward um, to be released from the green belt. It's, it's, it requires a very detailed planning and economic case and, and that information is, is on our website. It should yield around half of our requirements in our local plan period. But as you all appreciate and those that uh, travel within the area, Junction 5 is a busy junction. And so you won't be um, surprised to hear that we are having very detailed discussions with Highways England regarding infrastructure improvements around Junction 5. So it's, it's one that is, needs a lot of work, a lot of planning, but it's something that the council is committed to try and uh, secure allocation. Okay. This is um, a, a very interesting site that's become available in, in our town centre of Blackburn. So just in the same way that we've um, 
We've got a major investment program for Darwin. This is uh, an, a, an area of work that uh, the council's keen to move forward with and really repurposing our town centres, you know, is high on the agenda for many councils. Um, it's obviously all in the news following the demise of the retail property sector in particular and the impacts of COVID. And so the council is working hard in identifying an alternative vision for our town centres. And so when this site became available, the Fwaite site, for those that know, the former Daniel Fwaite's brewery site, and they relocated into um, Mella with a, a small microbore brewery. So this site became available and with uh, the adjacent site, the former market site, for those that have got long memories, might remember the market site, the indoor three and five day market. These are two sites that are available and for redevelopment. So because it's of significant importance for the council, a large strategic site within the town centre, this will help us move our repurposing the town centre forward. Um, typically, these type of sites will identify for retail, but we know that's not where these sites are destined for. Um, so the council's decided to take a, an active role in reshaping the town centre has formed a new joint venture company um, with Eric Wright development arm called Maple Grove. And we are progressing the acquisition of weights. So the Fwaite site will become a council owned um, within the JV partnership um, so that we can bring a comprehensive plan forward for that redevelopment. So the new, the new JV will take a leadership role and will help uh, realize a vision for a new employment district and potentially a residential quarter uh, that will build on the success of the cathedral um, district. So it's an exciting project and can confirm that the council's um, taken a, an, an active role in, in that site. Okay. And that's just, if you click again, you can see the site in the form of Fwaites and the market site. So that Fwaites site is no longer, it's actually a cleared site now. Okay. So one of the more contentious areas of any local plan, certainly with residents, is uh, planning for infrastructure, um, such as the items, areas I've identified there, roads, schools, health centres, etc. Um, the council's been working hard in the background, all these uh, key areas, working with our key stakeholders, utility companies, uh, CCG, uh, the Acute Trust, um, because we've got interventions planned for all of those areas um, and it's important because that's uh, what all residents want is that we plan for this infrastructure. It's worth pointing out that the council doesn't necessarily deliver that infrastructure but what our responsibility through the local plan process is to plan for it and ensure all the stakeholders United Utilities, all the utility providers are aware of the plans and can um, feed uh, our proposals into their sort of asset management plans uh, that they undertake on a sort of five yearly um, cycle. Okay. So pleased to say that our consultations have gone well um, during this local plan period. We had a, a consultation period in January, February of this year. And we purposely made the uh, consultation more focused, almost like a marketing campaign, because we wanted to ensure that all residents were engaged, you know, that let it drop to every single resident and, and business within the borough. And this was particularly important because we didn't have any face to face meetings. Usually we um, people like myself and colleagues and um, politicians will stand up and explain the proposals to the public at sort of organized events unfortunately because of the pandemic we weren't able to do that however we were strongly encouraged um told if you like by the government to get on with the local plan so waiting and just waiting wasn't wasn't an option um so we we made sure that we um, used all the tools social media tools to engage with um, the, you know, the, the public and residents prepared a video uh, which received over 15,000 views on different platforms. We had over 7,000 website views uh, and in total we got about 900 or so responses to our local plan 
three quarters of them through sort of electronic means, half through the website directly. So, you know, the sort of days of, um, of going through reams of paper of, uh, of gone, it can all now be analysed through a, a database approach. Um, and we're really pleased with that engagement so far. Okay. So the sort of final, final poll question for everybody is just, what would you consider to be the biggest barrier for your organisation considering investing in Blackburn with Darwin? That's, that's interesting. So a real spread there, I think, Simon, across, across all three. And I think um, you, you, you'd be pleased to know that uh, the council is taking active steps to uh, address all of those issues. Supply of quality labour, you know, the, the links there we have with um, Blackburn College and some of our key employers. Uh, availability of land, yep, that's something that we've picked up on directly in a, in a local plan. I think that, Simon, is, is, is it really. Um, I've put the, the link to the website. Um, so all the documents that we refer to in the local plan, including videos, uh, is there on the local plan webpage. And if there's not any hard questions, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be pleased to answer any easy ones. We'll, we'll include um, a PDF of those slides as well in, in the email that goes afterwards because I don't know if, like me, I was, I was peering at that map to try and work out <laughs> whereabouts is that and what's, what road's that. So when you get the PDF, you'll be able to look in more detail at the, at the, at the maps that were included. Any, uh, any quick questions for Simon? I know we've answered a couple in the, in the chat already. Uh, Helen's been working hard for you. Um, anyone got Thank any you. questions? I'll throw one at you just just um, just to show I was paying attention. How how hard has it been for the council then? Because you know people traditionally organisations of the size of the council can can find it difficult to sort of move into new ways of working. All of a sudden you've got to do this huge consultation exercise and you can't physically go into a meeting room. How hard was that transition and how um, what lessons have you learned during it? A really good question, Simon. I would say that we. Uh, we called on our colleagues from communications who were sort of very uh, skilled in almost thinking about the local plan engagement as a marketing campaign. So we, um, we, we had uh, bus shelter ads, we've had uh, billboard ads. We, we, we tried to make sure that everybody in the borough was at least aware there was a local plan. Um, the, the video was part of that, engaging our youth MP is part of that, Twitter, um, all, all, all of the social media sort of platforms, that was the key part of the local plan that was new you know, to colleagues, you know, with colleagues from planning backgrounds and not social media backgrounds. So it was important that we, we use those modern forms of communication, which has worked to the benefit. You know, it would be nice to have a few um, public meetings and I think you know for, for, for people out there who don't use social media me included uh, I think going to an event and, and speaking to people you can't really replace that but we tried our best in challenging times. All right. Thanks Simon. Um, I think we're done for questions so um, if no one has any more I'll just... Um... Simon there's a question in no, the there? chat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay go on Anita do you want to unmute yourself and put your question direct please? Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Simon. How as a business do we get involved? We're a construction business based in Lancashire. Um, so uh, the local plan was directed to all residents and uh, organisations within the borough, um, but we've obviously engaged with other authorities uh, bordering and all the key stakeholders. But I'd say the best way is just to, is to go through online um, to, the, um, to the local plan webpage. Um, my colleague Helen will send you those details, um, but but just to drop us a line, I think you know things like this that we try and get the message out, and I suppose we can only do that so much. But uh, yeah, if you contact us directly, we you can get involved. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thanks, Anita, and thank you, Simon. Thank you also to uh, to Rachel, to Antoinette, Brilliant. and to uh, to Hannah, our other speakers today. Uh, we will include all our speakers' contact details in the post event email and also the uh, the slides. If you uh, if you need to catch it again, uh, it'll be on YouTube. In fact, maybe fifteen years time, we can watch Simon's video and see how much of it comes true. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of it will. Um, but you'll awesome. live forever online now. Um, <laughs> 
Thank you so much to all our speakers. Thanks for attending today's Construction Connections event. We have our upcoming Construction Connections event, which, fingers crossed, will be held a mixture of in-person at Accrington and Rosendale College. And if you're unable to join us physically in person, then we'll be doing an online version of the event simultaneously. So our hybrid event, construction event, on the 23rd of June, uh, which isn't that far away. And um, we hope to see you all then. Uh, do check chamberlive.co.uk for all our upcoming events as well. And more importantly, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching this Chamber Live video from the East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. If you've enjoyed this content, then you might enjoy some of the other content that's on the screen now. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel.